Many people in Boston know the story of urban renewal and displacement. This was also the story of the Cape Verdean community in the Fox Point section of Providence, Rhode Island. Our guest is a former resident of Fox Point who reconstructs the vanished history in documentary films, and you can see her work here locally at the Museum of Fine Arts. Along with being a filmmaker and historian, she's a professor of Africana and post-colonial media studies at Emerson College. We'd like to welcome Claire Andrade Watkins. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Claire. Thank you. First of all, uh, I have not been to this section of Providence. I guess most of our viewers have not been uh, to Fox Point. Uh, what was this neighborhood like? Well, Fox Point is nestled near the waterfront and um, the port. And that became the destination for waves of immigrants coming into Rhode Island, which is an industrial state. So we followed on the heels of the Irish who would come into the Blackstone Canal project and the Cape Verdeans started arriving in the early 1900s and the Cape Verdeans, and I'm a descendant of the Fox Point community, um, was a former Portuguese colony off the coast of West Africa and Cape Verdeans are um, the only group of the Africana diaspora that arrived on their own vessels. So we literally sailed up the bay and got off at the docks at India Point and Fox Point and settled in that community where the work that the Cape Verdean immigrants did was the work nobody else wanted to do on the waterfront, domestics, and in the factories. Um, so you're dealing with a community that had been there about three generations, a hundred years last year for my grandmother, actually. Well, one of the most important points you're trying to make is that uh, the planners would eventually uh, look at this as, uh, as an unstable, uh, you know, not so wonderful community that needed to be improved or renewed. And I guess one of the points in your documentary is that if you talk to the people who lived in it, there's a totally different feel. Well, there's the difference the, about having history that was erased before it was written, which happened to the Cape Verdeans, which is a very, you know, a very, the, the largest community of Cape Verdeans outside of Cape Verde is in the United States, and Rhode Island's one of the earliest and largest. Um, it really was that historic intersection between urban renewal and the beginning of visioning the saving of historic houses of architectural and historic significance. But the loaded question there is, who determines what is significant for preservation? And that vision was basically created in a brilliant, you know, historic manner by John Brown um, through the College Hill Plan, um, which was this vision for saving the historic homes on College Hill that were being torn down to build housing for the Brown students. This is BNN News, and we're talking with Claire Andrade Watkins of Emerson College. Uh, turning back to uh, w one of these documentaries, uh, when you talk to neighborhood residents, uh, uh, there was this feel that, that this was a, a wonderful neighborhood. Uh, people were, it was a whole network that, that was going on there. It was, and you're dealing with a community that was intact. You're dealing with a strong sense of community, own distinct language cultural traditions, language, um, kinship, and they created most of, like many immigrant communities, their own institutions. The first beneficent association, um, the union, the first black predominantly Cape Verdean union, local 1329 of the International Longshoremen's Association, and that became the economic lifeline for the whole Cape Verdean community. And so it was a self-contained unit. Um, it might be poor, but poverty is a state of mind. As an immigrant community, where you're able to provide your own income, have your churches, your community support, um, your kinship ties, you're pretty much an intact, it was a stable community. We lived, my parents you know, settled on the street where I was born, and they were there 35 or 40 years. It was not an unstable, transient community. And we're gonna bring up an excerpt from one of the documentaries. That's an unbelievable place as far as I'm concerned. I can leave here and cross that bridge and I get a feeling that I'm as safe as I'm ever gonna be and people cared about me, they cared about my family. There's nothing better than Fox Point as far as I'm concerned. The food, the church, the community, it was all there. You've seen these people all your life, in and out of their houses. No one locked their doors. 
knock and just walk in. And always something cooking. Mm -hmm. So what all three of you are telling me, my three favorite musketeers, is that this was a community, but it was a way of life, that you all were born together and raised together. Oh, right. Is that right? You never saw kids that needed anything. Your mother got sick, the community took care of you. You never had keys to the house because nobody was going to your house to steal from you because nobody had anything. Anyhow, we, we all were in the same boat. We were all broke, so nobody, nobody robbed for anything. But we helped. It was just one great immune fight. As Harold says, that was the Cape Verdean community. Everybody took care of everybody, and, uh, and, and the thing about it was that you, you, when you worked, you worked with your friends, you know? Your boss was your friend, and uh, everybody was friends. And the thing, about, the thing about us is when the job was over, all those guys who worked together, we hung together. Perry, I, I have to ask you, uh, what was it like for you talking to these former residents after this gap in time and, and after which their, their presence had been all but airbrushed? Well, you know, Chris, when you say talking to those residents, it's talking to me. That's where I was born and raised. I'm a second generation native of Fox Point, so the people I was talking to were my friends and family. We were trying to figure out what happened. And it was a reconstitution of what now is recognized as the classic kind of precedent type of urban renewal and displacement where, you know, the HUD and buildings were, that were considered substandard, and they were, they were run down tenements, but they were basically were condemned, and the area was considered urban blight. So your humanity became insignificant, and houses were what mattered and were saved and not people. So it's kind of, how could, why did this happen? Why did we have agency in the say of what happened? And there wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, a lot of this was, as you suggested, the federal government, plus there was also federal highway money involved here, too. You're dealing with the, yes, I-95. The I path of least resistance the for a highway. The path of least, and if you study, actually, the interstate system across the United States, you will see this pattern. It goes through the urban centers of poor, and this pattern of, dis, of displacement follows along the interstate highways across the country. So between the interstate highway coming through Fox Point, which cut our community in half, the expansion of Brown University, um, and other factors pushing for gentrification, we knew something was coming, but not being homeowners, people were mostly renters, so you weren't informed. Um, and when it started, there really was no recourse. You had no choice. They said, oh, well, you know, you can come back after we do the renovations and build the new buildings, but of course you couldn't even afford to come back. So they started jacking up people's rents two to three times to force them out that way. The buildings, they weren't condemned and they were forced to move. So it was really like an atomic bomb just scattered three generations of a community. It was mayhem from the late 60s to the mid-70s. I left to go to college here in Boston in 70. I was still on this, my parents were still on the street where I was born. Um, when I graduated from Simmons um, in 70, it was in a whole new location that was almost, you know, foreign to me. Uh, there's, a, there's a term uh, um, for a Cape Verdean, a Cape Verdean immigrants feel when they, when they leave Cabo Verde, um, Sodad. Do you, Sodad. Do you, do you feel that? Yeah. Sodad means a longing. And part of Cape Verdeans for centuries, I mean, one of our, we have always been uh, historically immigrants because of the centuries of drought, famine, um, economic deprivation, and harsh colonialism. So it's always been this leaving of the homeland. So this sodad is this feeling that saturates every part of our culture. And it, you feel it in the stories that people tell. And I think part of, the story of mine that I came to in telling this documentary is that being Cape Verdean is a state of mind, not a zip code, and that even though the physical space of Fox Point was destroyed, who we were as a community is still intact. Yeah, well, we have some uh, Cape Verdean communities around Boston who are sure very Absolutely. interested in this, more intact, thankfully. Uh, and tell us when this is going to be shown at the MFA. Well, well, they were, first of all, there were two waves of Cape Verdean immigration. The one in Fox Point was the first wave before the immigration laws of the 20s. The next major wave came after independence in 75, both in Pawtucket and in Boston. That was Roxbury, Dorchester, and then after the 90s, Brockton. So there's a series of documentaries I've done over these 30 years to document this chronicle. 
and on June 18th and 19th at the Museum of Fine Arts is a program devoted to the 30 years of the Chronicle. It's called um, Our Road, R-H-O-D-E, 30 Years of Cinema by and about Cape Verde, Rhode Islanders. And it includes the trilogy of documentaries that I've been doing. And it's the world premiere of the second of the three, Working the Boats, Masters of the Craft, about the legendary and storied Local 1329 of the International Longshoremen's Association. So it's, um, I'm really excited about it because it creates a canon and a space of a story that was overlooked, forgotten, or hidden and unknown. So it, it kind of brings to life and reconstitutes a very important narrative thread in urban history and American history. And it says we were here. Thank you very much for being here with us. Claire Andretti Watkins from Emerson College.